then you're saying that you paid prostitutes to wait outside. Oh, now, wait a minute. On, See if on. I got that's, the story that's right. Long. That long. Paid story prostitutes been written. for opposing players to distract them? Well, that's part of life. What? I mean, it's part of life. Come on now. You've been on the road before. It's part of life. No, but I don't pay yeah, for it. Listen, I'm not listen, paying yeah, for some Yeah, right, prostitutes. right. Well, listen, it's part of life, you know. And it, and it, and it has happened. You really did that? Listen, it, it, was, it was done to me. And I just carried on tradition. It's been <laughs> done for years and years. And guess what? And it's still done today. There's a picture behind you that uh, tonight, as we speak, and maybe they'll zoom in on this picture while we're talking for a second here. Uh, it's a photograph, a, m a montage that you signed that they're going to auction off. And, of course, it was the incredible night against the Raiders when uh, you played with tremendous heavy heart and you threw four touchdown passes in memory of your father. First time you were afraid to fail, maybe. I was afraid to fail. I guess my dad was not there to see me. You know, and people say, well, he was there watching. He was on your shoulder. I mean, something happened in that game because I was so scared, and, and I'd never played with that type of emotion, being so scared to fail. And not too many good things can happen when you're, when you're scared to, you know, to play bad. And so I said, maybe I'm making a mistake and I was telling myself that but I knew I couldn't back away at that point I couldn't go in and take my uniform off humility aside do you see his point not that you're the best but that you are doing something unique to this generation dominating with players who can run as fast and as big as they are run as fast as you and in, in pursuit of you what you're doing is unique um, yeah you know I can see his point but when I look at it from my standpoint, I really can't, I don't understand, you know, I guess how Marty feels because, I, you know, I'm doing it. I'm in my own body and I'm out there and, you know, sometimes I'm so hard on myself. Sometimes I say, you know, but I just wasn't good enough. You know, I did not do a good job at all this game. And, and so maybe someone else may look at and say, oh, well, you know, this happened or this happened. It doesn't matter to me if this happened or that happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the job done. Uh, it was tough enough uh, in the, I guess, early part of the 70s or so um, for African-American families to move into predominantly white neighborhood. But this was a tough time because yeah. there was vandalism. Someone had urinated in your home. They spray painted your outside, outside of your house. And there was a lot of pain there. So when this Limbaugh statement comes up, it opens some old wounds in your father. And I want to talk about that. Well, you know, my dad kind of, you know, was really upset about the fact that, you know, it did come kind of come back. And it brought some old memories back in which we obviously tried to erase. Uh, you know, at that time, I was about nine, ten years old. Uh, and, and for a father, you know, it's no better feeling to than to, you know, purchase a new home to kind of bring your family into, you know, a new home in which, you know, you kind of felt would be a, a wonderful place, a wonderful foundation for your kids to grow up. Uh, and now for all of us to come as a family to, to see the home and to see the windows knocked out and you know urination on the carpet you know writing on the walls uh, for us to not be accepted like anyone else uh, it was tough uh, but my dad you know was stay strong you know sat my brother and I down and, and told us you know you have to you have to be the better man in every situation so let's talk about the personalities. How are you different? And I know that's the cliche question, but how, how, how completely different we, do you think? We you talk are? about this often. And, um, you know, a lot of people think the nature of things are for, are for twins to be exactly alike. I mean, we do have a lot of similarities. We share same, a lot of the same friends, enjoy a lot of the same things, but um, we've been nurtured so differently the past nine, ten years since we've been yeah. apart um, that, you know, personalities change, tastes change. Obviously, his exposure in New York is a lot different than my exposure in Tampa, so. You know, it's uh, yeah. uh, our, our our interests. I think are more diverged now than they've ever been. So, but I think I think even going back to to our childhood, it was it, it was different. I've always been an academic. Where if I wasn't making straight A's, I was pissed. Where is Rondé was more of the athlete. I mean, people always ask you who's the better athlete. I'll I'll, I'll defer right away. My brother is the better athlete. You would never. I don't think unless you ever find yourself in that situation, it's hard to explain to your child just people just being dead wrong no no truth about it you know I'm okay with truth I'm okay if if you're able to slap something in my face and say here this is what you said this is what you done 
But to look at my child and, and go through what I went through and to tell my child, well, they, you know, they this, they doing this to daddy, they doing that to daddy. I, after I done that, Roy, I said, no way. No. Because I felt that same feeling every time I didn't have my father. Every time I asked my mom a question and she couldn't answer me. She mm -hmm. would never lie to me, but she just couldn't answer me. And that's the same emptiness I went back to. You know, and the thing that I after the full, I came full circle, the thing that I realized. is what God was really trying to show me. And that was that put your trust in no man. Tell no lies, even if it's your child. So that's why when I wept and I wept and I wept, and I said, Father, you know what? Even though I may have wronged him, there will be a time that I will let him know what really went down. But to take my child through that, through, through, through what I call a circus of uh, just whatever, it just wasn't right. One of the things that moved me and touched me the most was the fact that you told the folks, the press, at, when you could, that this boy never was afraid. Mm -hmm. He took on every challenge, and all he wanted to do was make sure everyone else was okay. He's mm -hmm. five years old. He's he's living a life and death. He's got a, he's got a heart disease, and this boy showed you courage mm -hmm. in ways that maybe adults could never show you. And I wonder if you can reflect on it. Yeah. Um, we called him Trevin to the, or he called himself Trevin to the rescue. He, he, he loved the superheroes like every five-year-old, and but he didn't want to be Spider-Man or Superman. He wanted to be his own superhero, and uh, he named himself Trevin to the rescue, and he really believed that he could rescue the sisters from any problem, um, people around him. He just, he, he always cared more about what was going on around him than himself. Um, you know, he was going to be an offensive lineman because he had that mentality. You know, he was into protecting people. And, mm. and uh, especially, you know, when he got sick, obviously he was on life support. But he could, when we took him off the medication enough to make sure his brain function was all right, he could tear up, he could blink, and he could squeeze your finger. And he never, you know, when you say, are you scared Trevin or any of that stuff, he never... He didn't react that much to that. What he reacted to was... It's like, stop? No. Uh, when his sisters were in the room, that hurt him. Um, when I got like this, uh, that you could see him tear up because he was sad for me. Um, he just had so much courage. He, he had such a big heart, and uh, I've just never seen a young person so concerned with how other people felt, and the, and that they were protected and safe and comfortable. I know that uh, having had some experience with you, you've always been a man of faith, mm -hmm. deeply religious person, um, and I know you believe that he lives on. Yeah and that uh, Trevin is smiling mm -hmm. and when you go to Cleveland this year to play football again mm -hmm. um, there's a little piece of you that's going to be there with him. I don't know if there's any mementos or artifacts or any, any gestures you make mm -hmm. with him in mind but I wonder if you can reflect on that. I, you know I, I thought what was a way that I could honor him you know through my career and, and uh, the really the one thing that I've tried to do and, and nobody would know it but uh, when we come in from warming up there's usually about a 10 minute period of time where it's somewhat quiet and, and guys fixing their pads making sure things all right and I go find a corner and and I just uh, I just pray you know Lord I know Trevin's sitting there right there with you um, give him a front row seat today huh. And uh, I, I just pray that through my attitude, you know, my actions, and my words today, that uh, he would be proud of me. Face to Face continues with Trent Dilfer when we return.